came on a job in 1994 in the NYPD and I was assigned in the Bronx. Uh, the morning of 9-11, as a Bronx cop, I was scheduled to work a night shift, a 6 p.m. to 2 in the morning shift. So I went to sleep the night before, which was Monday night. I can remember it like yesterday. It was the New York Giants playing, I think, the Denver Broncos, Monday night football. The game finishes late as you sure you guys know, Monday night football. And I just fell asleep in the living room. I woke up Tuesday morning, which was September the 11th, with the TV still on from passing out to the football game, with the news now, I guess, Channel 7, about an explosion in Manhattan, a uh, aircraft explosion. So I thought probably one of those West Side Highway uh, helicopters, Taurus or something in an accident. Never would imagine what turned out we would be facing. About a half hour later, as I'm home, just doing my normal morning routine with the news still on, and I'm not even really paying attention to it, to be honest. My job is calling me and telling me, you know, there's a uh, potential terrorist attack. Get into work. This was probably around 9 a.m. So I get into work as soon as I can, and they tell us, yes, we're under terrorist attack. At that time, the second tower was already hit, I believe, as I was driving into work on the radio. It was just crazy. And it really hit me now. It was surreal. Like, never in our years will we ever imagine something like this not here in our soil i remember saying it's just so surreal like this can't be happening because it was driving it to work on the highway i remember with the radio on and all the phone calls and everybody on my job running it to work it's called a full mobilization which i've never seen yet you heard about it but you've never seen it where they just all hands on deck every cop come into work and firemen, I'm sure. So when I get to work, we get assigned. The first assignment we had that morning was a high school in the Bronx because apparently the military was going to land their helicopters on the football field. So we had to just secure the football field. The first thoughts we have is you're frustrated. You want to be down there. It's going on as we speak. The second tower, like I said, I can't exactly remember the timestamp, but it was within an hour or so, and we're just standing in the Bronx. There's three or four of us at the time just watching the football field in the Bronx, which, again, you want to just get down to Manhattan. But I understand, you know, you have to run an entire city, and there's a, basically a military operation going on. Later that day, we get posted in the late afternoon to the Jacoby Hospital Morgue because apparently they're telling us there may not be enough room in the lower Manhattan to upper Manhattan hospitals and we're going to have to secure the morgue on what could be coming, basically like a crime scene. So we had the security detail is what it was. While we're at the morgue awaiting that awful situation, it's early evening now, um, we would check on the ER because it was chaos in the ER. The reason for that all the way up in the Bronx is because the firemen and some cops would go all the way as far as these ERs to get treated. I guess these were the guys that were injured on the lighter side and could just go there because everything in that zone area was just, every resource was overwhelmed. Uh, one of the colleagues I had with me, a good friend of mine to this day, was handling phone calls on a personal matter with somebody in his wedding party, I mean, that close of a friend, who's a fireman, I'll say his name, it's uh, Sean Talon, 
God rest his soul. And Pat, our Pat in the police department, I had two Pats in my little group. He uh, was handling the calls with the family who was concerned. They have not heard from Sean all day. And again, he is a firefighter assigned in Manhattan. So obviously there's a huge anxiety over this. And Pat being the guy he is, is like, I'll find them. Don't worry. So I'll get into that in a second. When I get down to Manhattan, I'll explain how the chaos of how just everybody was lost. And I don't want to, let me stick with one at a time. So our Pat in the police department, you could see his anxiety, his hands are shaking. He's just nervous because he's obviously expecting the worst and he doesn't know what to say to this poor family that's so close with him. And where, you know, where is Sean? So back to the ER at Jacoby Hospital, and it's definitely evening to midnight time. I'm guessing now approximately 8 to 10 p.m., long day of us just doing security. Uh, we walk over to the ER, which is kind of around the corner from the morgue, to speak to the firemen. And I knew one of the firemen, and I'll say his name, great great guy. He used to be a former police officer, Stephen Duffy. And I was happy to see him one to just acknowledge he's okay and walk over and go, Hey, Steve, this is my buddy, Pat. And he's looking for his friend. At, I can't remember the engine, you know, the, the FDNY truck that he was assigned to Sean, but Steve quickly came out and just shook his head. Like, no way, no way. And Steve looked like he was in shock. He still had, he, he was pale. He had all the smoke all over him, probably all, all, all the debris. I mean, all over him, just looked horrible. And he wasn't himself, obviously, and just went, no way. That engine company, no way. Again, it's, uh, that's Sean Talon, uh, our, our story of Sean with my, my partner, Pat. Uh, it's, it's really hitting, it's hitting home now, like, wow, you know, it's hit home. This poor, uh, our colleague who was devastated. We get later into the night where we cannot leave the Bronx because you need law and order in the Bronx. You still have assignments and we get to the end of our shift. At the end of our shift, we had to go down. We all wanted to drive down there and uh, feel like we can do something or help or so myself and three or four colleagues went down to don't know what to do. You just drive, you just had to go down there. Like what is going on? And more Pat, cause he still felt like he just needed to say he looked for his friend in the FDNY. We get down there. It's now gotta be after two in the morning. Cause that's when our shift ended. I believe either two or four in the morning. It's hard to exactly remember so long ago. But now I remember when we walked into the zone of ground zero, uh, there was no, obviously no structure, no like an ordinary NYPD function where it is obviously uh, a lot of structured and, you know, north, right. And this was just pure chaos. And I remember saying, it looked like a movie set. It looked like a Hollywood movie set. Like when you're in the city and you're walking to get your coffee and you've come across Hollywood filming, whatever TV show in Manhattan with all those trucks parked, that's what it reminded me of. It just looked fake. It was just piles of dust and debris and the cars parked were all smashed. If not smashed, you couldn't even tell what kind of make it a car, the police cars, the fire trucks. And, and the closer we got as we're walking, I think we started on like, we parked as far as like West Broadway, the closer you got, it was just more of the chaos. Um, it's quiet at this time, obviously it's so late at night and everybody is just so 
spent, so tired. I'm sure more than half these people were there since the afternoon. Others were brought in for the evening and everybody was just done. You see it in their face. There was no conversation. It was the only time I've seen a group. So like we call it a detail in the police department, so many cops and there wasn't talking conversation like your normal parade or, or St. Patty's Day, Puerto Rican Day Parade, all those events with large gatherings of police. Everybody is just dead silent, either standing around, guys are taking breaks, drinking water. There's a lot of medical people from the hospitals showing up to, to help clean out faces and to this matter. Um, that was it on September 11th. Went home, almost the sun coming out. I'm, I mean, it was late. And then the next day, I was assigned to a security post at the World Trade Center, uh, right in that range. Our job was just to block a street and only let the proper personnel in, military, police, and clean up. We were there for 12 hours just doing security. Again, this is night two. This was uh, same feeling, Hollywood movie set, still dust all over the place, still brought home when I walked home. Again, you have to leave your shoes outside or up to your knees. The debris is just all over the place. I mean, as you're just standing there or take a walk and there was no, uh, there were stores open and this is in the zone. I mean, you're buying food, you're buying water. Nobody knew. I, I, I don't say it in a negative way to blame anybody. Who knew? Who's prepared for this? Um, a war zone. A war zone in, a, in a, at least a minimum of a square mile anywhere you went in that lower Manhattan area. And we were right there a block or two from the security zone. So... After that shift, which was September the 12th, what we did for days to at least a week after was volunteered and did the cleanup line, which they called the bucket line. You'd show up for an hour or two. Everybody had to participate. Didn't have to. You weren't ordered to, but it was just the right thing to do. It was too overwhelming and they just didn't have the resources. And, and it was just a passionate thing because these bodies were there. And we all felt you had to do your part. And it was just lines of us with Home Depot buckets or whatever buckets, guys, just everybody just donating and just cleaning up. A line of us just literally going yards, 10, 20, 30 yards a line of passing buckets to a dump truck and just cleaning it out. And that's what we did for days. And it was more, I think, psychological. You felt you had to do it because your brothers were in there, you know, guys you knew or it didn't matter, know them or not know them, the right thing to do. And let's not forget, and I always said this, you know, later on, I was happy I took part in that because of just all the people that were in these towers you know it doesn't have to be a police or a fireman it's just all these people so we did this for about a i can't you know five six seven days and then it just burnt you out all the hours and then there was so many more people getting involved on the cop and fireman side and and i mean all over the state all over the state all over the east coast there were guys coming in from everywhere, Maryland, you name it, Virginia, meaning police officers or firemen, they just wanted to help out. So there was plenty of that. There was a lot of camaraderie and it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing in an awful time, if that makes sense. Everybody to come together, that's for sure. Uh, another guy during that time that I worked with is Patrick McGovern later on became my partner at the time of 9-11 pat was just a rookie who uh was assigned to the 49th precinct and the uh 
unit I was in in the Bronx happened to have an office in the 49th precinct. And I knew some of his family members prior. So we always looked out for Pat as the young guy coming on the job. And he was a, just a real fun, fun guy. Great kid. And on September the 11th, he too was assigned to the Bronx. I'm not sure what his assignment was, but I was with Pat doing these bucket lines and volunteering and going down there days after because we all came from the same building and we coordinated and we drove down. And I remember spending a lot of time with Pat down there. So fast forward now, years later, I get very close with Pat because we happen to become partners in a, it's called CRV, which is an omnipresence unit for counterterrorism. What we were, we uniformed guards basically in high profile areas in Manhattan. And uh, we had a great time. We were very, very close. We did the midnight shift in car, on foot, and you spent a lot of time together. And uh, unfortunately, when Pat was about 38 years old, I could be a little off with age, but he was diagnosed with a rare stomach, colon, liver, cancer, at least rare for a young man that age. And we lost Pat to this 9-11 cancer, I, I believe at 43 years old, which was a year ago this May. So it's been a year. Um, and that's uh, pretty much the most I can remember on 9-11. How's your health, Chris? Okay, so I have uh, a few things. Luckily, uh, I get checked every year. I have about the 9-11 program has me monitored for uh, four ailments that can be, you know, I'm certified for 9-11. Um, bad. The biggest thing is the sinus and, and of course the GERD. You don't breathe the same. Your face is swollen. I did not have any of this prior. It came on a few years later, a year later or so, uh, and it just gets worse and worse to the point now when I eat, I cannot breathe. I have no good capacity out of my, my nose, which I'm taking care of right now. Sleep apnea, another uh, lovely diagnosis. And the sleep apnea could get dangerous because it goes into your heart. And I'm treated for that. Uh, I have uh, electrical issues in my heart that uh, doctors say can be from the sleep apnea. So also being treated for that. So yeah, there's a, there's a few ailments due to this. Do you have any PTSD? Because I, almost everyone I talk to okay. has PTSD. And, and tell our listeners what that means in your av everyday life. Uh, Shelly, it's a great question because I'm 49 years old. And if you would have asked me this question prior to Pat, I would have said no. So all these years, and I just spoke to somebody at the 9-11 program. They were very good. All these years... No, I ignore it. I don't, uh, I don't get involved in the discovery channel or, or any of the documentaries, you know, I kind of look away, but no, I would say no, 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 I'm fine. You know, and that's a lot of cops and firemen, eh, just a lot of people, not just again. And, but it is a big thing with first responders. Um, I call it the Rocky mentality, you know, no pain, no gain, and not us, and no way. And then recently, as far as a few years ago, I am retired now, and I do do private security. And obviously, you know, an area where I am that has a view of the new tower, the Freedom Tower. It's a beautiful view from Tribeca. Uh, 
Pat was back to Patrick McGovern. He was being treated with his chemo during his treatment. And I would not miss a chemo or at least try not to miss his sessions and be there with him with a lot of cops. Um, the room was always full of guys and it was great. Uh, you know, we did the best we could for Pat and just keep him laughing. But as far as to answer your question, what I'm trying to get at was I'm standing in my new world. My new life is private security, a retired NYPD and dealing with Pat and some, you know, family members with chemo. The 9-11 is now more in my mind. It's coming back because I was helping Pat getting certified because I also was Pat's union rep when he got the cancer. This was all taking place the last year of my, my before retiring. So it all came back sitting with 9-11 lawyers and going back and mm -hmm. how can this man have this ailment? So... I'm in Tribeca looking at the Freedom Tower and dealing with Pat's chemo, and I felt the anxiety, something I hadn't felt before, a little bit of dizziness or just feel like the everyday anxiety. And then I constantly started thinking back of 9-11. Never did this before. So it took all these years to manifest. Um, I did speak to one professional, like I said, who was a lot of help and said that's very common. It can take that long and something dramatic like losing a loved one to 9-11. Uh, you know, even though we lost so many that I did know, I mean, there's a lot, especially now. It, 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 you don't even want to go on Facebook. and Well, at least I don't because it, you feel like it's every week. It's every week. It's the guys from that era you know, in your early 50s, late 50s, 40s, all the guys around my time that were on the job back then, it, it's just starting. And these are still young people. These are not old people. Again, Pat was 43. He was diagnosed at 38. Uh, so yeah, seeing it now when I'm in lower Manhattan, it does bring back a lot. So yeah, to answer your question, we all have it. Hopefully some better than others or some just... It hasn't come out, but if you were down there or you were on a job during that time and you knew the guys that unfortunately didn't make it or you helped volunteering, uh, yeah, I was just in Long Beach, had a beautiful day recently, did my social distancing, stayed away uh, on the beach, and uh, you see the planes coming into JFK. I can't tell you how that felt because they're so low, obviously coming down from the beach, you know, they land into JFK right at Long Beach. Oh yeah, I couldn't even look at it. it. It was, I kid you not. And I never thought I'd be saying this, never. Does the NYPD provide help in terms of therapy? Since this hit you so late, and I look at the number of police suicides and some of the ages of those we have lost to suicide. Has the NYPD looked into that connection and are they offering therapy still now, 19 years later, heading into the 20th year? There is therapy. There is resources you can reach out, but it could be a lot better. It can absolutely be a lot better. And I was just in touch with somebody who I'm gonna, I have to put you in touch with him, uh, who volunteers now with the Mount Sinai 9-11 program, and he does great things. And we both were just saying, you know, we, we actually met for coffee and how they can do more. And the other problem is you have to reinsure police officers, and I'm sure firemen too. Guys are scared to reach out when you're in the police capacity. They're just scared. Uh, it was always that perception, like don't speak to anybody, kind of like you're going to get in trouble. We're, that's the stigma they have to get over that hurdle for these guys. Uh, 
you have to speak to somebody. You have to let it out. So yes, they do have some resources, um, but it's weak. You know, I, I'll stand at anybody and tell them straight out, it's weak. But it's something, it's a start. You have to take the initiative. You have to really open up to whichever program you're in. They provide social service. You tell them and you'll go in the program. Uh, but yeah, they could do more. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, I think we're good. I'm so happy I got to talk about Pat McGovern, uh, just a great guy, and I miss him, and it's, uh, again, so surreal, and he was just so full of life, and, you know, for going down there and doing what he did, he's a hero, you know, for and so many others. I can't sit here and start name dropping. We'll be here forever. There's so many. It's just Pat. I was a one-on-one -on -one partners with in our unit. So it's a little harder and, and sat through his whole treatment. But uh, Pat did something every shift. I would like to just say prior to his diagnosis, he always loved to buy ice cream before his shift started. We would start the car find that Dunkin' Donuts late night with the late night, I think it's Baskin and Robbins, and he would love his chocolate ice cream. And if there was a homeless guy outside, um, he'd always buy them ice cream. That's just the everyday Pat. That's the kind of guy we lost. I wish we had him here today. Um, but as far as 9-11, yeah, I just feel, uh, you know, the guys, I did it. Reach out. If you can reach out, to somebody because I never thought I would have the feelings I have now. It does all come out. It manifests. And when it hits you, it can hit you hard. But that's really all I have, Shelly. Okay. I thank you, Chris.